Hello, Fox River. How's it going? Good, good, good. It's a good weekend, isn't it? It's good. Hey, uh, I am just so glad to be here with you this morning that we can worship Jesus together and hear from him. I pray that happens, by the way. Um, and I'm just so thankful for the opportunity that God has given me and that each of you have given me to be your pastor. Just so, so thankful for that. I don't know if you knew this about me or not, but I, before my pastoring days here at Fox River, I was actually a teacher for a few years. So, and there's, there's some things about teaching that I really, really miss, okay? Um, for example, I really miss teaching students about algebra and trigonometry and pre-calculus, because that can be like really, really hard sometimes, right? So, so I, I really enjoyed making it easier than maybe it was otherwise. So uh, I, I really miss that. I really miss, you know, giving advice to students who need it. It's a tough time in life, right? So just, just help them, walk them with them. Um, being a mentor to them in some ways. I also miss just honestly praying for them. I miss seeing them mature, not only as young men and women, but I miss seeing them mature in their faith even. All right, I miss those things. Those are good things. But one thing I just don't miss is grading tests. Oh, it's terrible. These, these, so many of the tests were just Really, really bad. So it was just, it not only did it take a long time, because the more wrong answers there are, the longer it takes to grade, you know. Um, but, but man, it was just so frustrating because I knew they could have done better, okay. So, so I, I tried to set them up for success. And, and man, any, any teachers out there, by the way? Like, like, okay, yeah. So you know exactly. Any parents out there? Like, oh my gosh, same thing, right? So it's like, man, um, I, I was just so frustrated. I tried to set them up for success. I would, for example, I would create a study guide for them. And I would design it in such a way. And I, and I told them this too, by the way. I said, man, this study guide is gonna be structured exactly the same as the test. All right, you're gonna show up tomorrow and you're not gonna be, you shouldn't be at least, surprised about what the test looks like or what types of problems are on there. Man, I am like totally setting you up for success. All right, so I would give them the study guide. But then on top of it, I would make an answer key to that study guide. Okay, and not only would I create the answers for them or figure out the answers, but I'd also do a step-by-step, -step, like a detailed study guide uh, solution key. And I'd make that available. All they had to do was come up to the classroom towards the end of the day and, and, and pick it up. And that was the one time, every chapter is the one time I said, it's okay for you to copy down the answers. I will give you full credit. You can just, I, I just want you to do so well. So you copy down the answers, make corrections, study all of that. Sad truth is this, hardly any students used the study guide. Hardly any students came up towards the end of that day and picked up the answer key to prepare for that test. It was so, so frustrating. But you know what the problem was? The problem was they weren't smart enough. That wasn't the problem. It had nothing to do with IQ, all right? It didn't have anything to do with the color of their skin. The problem was this. They were comfortable. They had become complacent in their life. They weren't hungry to do better. Now, this, that, that's true in the classroom. That's also true when it comes to Christianity. You want to kill a church? Get them comfortable. You want to spiritually, I know it's a little graphic, but you want to spiritually castrate a Christian? Get them to be complacent. Get them to go with the flow. Get them to even comply with culture instead of being concerned about building the house of their life on the rock. Now, a lot of that was about my students and about their math tests. But in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is telling his students, that's us, his students about the most important test they will ever face. And that's what we're going to get into in just, just a couple seconds. Now, I think this could be, and I hope it is for so many of us, I think this could be one of those days or one of those weekends, or if you're watching it on demand online, this could be one of those Tuesdays or Wednesdays, whenever you watch, okay? This could be one of those days that's just like a turning point in your life where for some beautiful reason, the light bulb just kind of came on in your mind. And you look back and say, man, that, that's when not only did my life change, but my eternity changed. Maybe a couple hundred years from now, when we're not breathing the same type of oxygen, I don't know how it's gonna work, but, but maybe we look back and say, man, that was the weekend that God really, he really reached me in a fantastic way. That's when I started. I didn't, I didn't begin to run the race like, you know, like Usain Bolt, 
but, but I, was, I was running it like, like maybe Pastor Bill, like with a limp, you know? And I just started, and, and this could be the weekend. So I, I, anyways, enough, enough of that, that prelude. Let's, let's get into it, okay? Let's pray together. Let's approach the Lord in prayer that we don't go at this thing alone, all right? Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. God, it is a gift. We recognize that, and we say thank you because you did not have to give it to us, but God, you did give us today. You carved it out. These, these few minutes that we have right now, you've even carved those out out of all eternity. Lord, you served them up to us on a silver platter that we might hear from you. And I pray that we do. I pray that we do hear from you. Lord, I pray and I ask that we would understand what you're trying to tell us. And Lord, by your grace, that we might hear your good words. God, that we might respond to them by faith. God, that we might hear your good words and put them into practice. Lord, above all, we ask this, that the name of Jesus Christ would be glorified. We pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. All right, let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. You can turn there in your Bibles or on your digital device of choice, your call, or you can just follow along, okay? If you, if you want to do that, you're just feeling a little on the lazy side today, that's, that's okay. You're in a safe place, okay? So Matthew chapter 7. We're going to get into Matthew 7. Matthew 7 occurs at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is Matthew's chap- Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So 7 is at the end of the sermon, okay? The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' first sermon ever. And many people say it's his greatest sermon ever as well. Now, why do they call it the Sermon on the Mount? Because Jesus is teaching this sermon while sitting on a mountainside. Sermon on the Mount or mountainside. And Jesus is telling his hearers, hey, this is how you live here and now. It's very practical, very real life teaching. This is how you live today. All right, and as he's teaching, just like rabbis of that day did, he's he's. He's saying the whole sermon, but then at the end of the sermon, after all the information has been shared, he is bringing his hearers to a decision point. He's saying, listen, I told you a bunch of information. All right, I told you about the Beatitudes, right? Blessed are those, right, who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those poor in spirit. Switch those around. That's one and two, but I said them in the wrong order. <laughs> okay, but he's but blessed are, right, and he has a bunch of those. He's like, I told you about salt and light. You can be salt and light. I told you, hey, watch out. Beware of hypocrisy. It'll, it'll, it'll destroy your faith and it'll destroy your future, right? Be careful of that, all right? And don't, don't walk around with a judgmental or critical spirit, right? Rather help people, love people like your father has helped and loved you. Like I've told you about this. You've got a ton of information now, but it's not about information. Jesus is bringing his hearers to this decision point and he's saying, what will you do with it? What will be your response And if we're willing to receive it, he's asking us that same question now. What will be our response? So, let's get into it. Matthew 7, we'll start in verse 24. Here we go. Therefore, because he said all this stuff, so therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down. The streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. Listen, there is a good and right way to build a house that lasts. A wise builder must first find a firm foundation, right? You want to build a house on the rock, because if you don't build it on the rock, your house doesn't stand a chance, does it? Right? So, so a wise builder always finds a firm foundation to build upon. Now, in a spiritual sense, because Jesus, he might enjoy architecture, but he's not, he's not teaching us about architecture. Okay? In a spiritual sense, Jesus is saying there's only one way for you to build your house. Right? He's talking about your life. And it begins with Jesus. Because Jesus and his teachings, they are the rock. Now listen, I know there's other options out there. Okay, you can can build the house of your life on following all the rules. You can do that. You can say, man, I'm gonna gonna obey the speed limit. I'm just gonna do it. I know nobody else does, but I'm just gonna, you know? (laughs) I yeah. So you can do that. You you can base your life decisions based on money. 
Like, man, if I choose this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make money. Or if I make this decision, I'm gonna lose money. You can, you can, you can let that be the basis for your life decisions. Or, or maybe popularity. I mean, if I act this way, or if I say this certain thing, or if I post this material, or, or like this comment, or, or, or like, like that will make me more popular. That'll make me look better in the eyes of men and women and, and family members and friends and, and even in, in just culture as a whole. Like, like you, can, you can make your life decisions based on that. You know, for Christians, God even gives us this freedom, all right? And I'm talking about Christians now. So he even gives us the freedom to live our life in a way where we seek success, where we pursue power at all costs. I don't know if you knew this, but some Christians are unkind. Some Christians in the business world, they can be kind of like cutthroat. I don't know if you've ever encountered somebody like that. Maybe you're like starting to sweat, like, man, that's me. Okay, oh man. You know, like, like, like you, you, you can do that. Those are all examples of what it means, though, right? Because you're making those decisions. You're living your life, and, and Christ isn't a part of that equation. Those are all examples of what it means to build the house of your life on the sand. Not on the rock, not on the state, but on the sand. Huh. But Jesus is like, listen, you've heard my words. You've received my good teachings. And you know they're different. You know I teach with authority. All right? You've heard this. Now, if you put my words, my teachings into practice, you are wise. Because not only have you found a firm foundation, but you are building the house of your life on the rock. Let's keep reading, verse 26. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Once again, there is a good and right way to build a house that lasts. A foolish builder builds on sand, but a wise builder finds a firm foundation, and a wise builder also selects strong building materials. Materials make a difference. Now, in a spiritual sense, because Jesus is not teaching about agriculture, in a spiritual sense, Jesus is saying there's only one way for you to build a house that lasts. Yes, it begins with Jesus, but it also continues with Jesus. So let's just pause for a second. What do you know God wants you to do? Right, this is different for each one of us, okay? What have you read and you're like, God wants me to do that? What have you heard? God wants me to do that. What in your spirit do you know God wants me to do that? Are you doing it? How are you building the house of your life? Are you building it on the rock? Now, I want to show you something. You can turn there if you want, okay, or, or not. It's totally fine. But I'm, I'm going to take us to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 just, just for a couple minutes here, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3. This is Paul writing to the Corinthian church. We're not going to go into a ton of background there. But, but he's writing to his hearers, people he loves. And, and here's what he says. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. You see some of that similar language going on already, don't you? Right? You get this foundation. I'm thinking rock. I'm thinking Jesus is the rock. And, and, and then Paul just says it, right? I mean, the foundation is, is Jesus Christ. Okay, cool, cool. All right, moving on. Verse 12, so similarities. If anyone builds on this foundation, Paul continues, using gold, silver, precious or costly stones, depending on the translation you're reading, right? Gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw or stubble, depending on your translation, right? You see the difference there? Gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, Straw, see the difference? Now you're going to see a real big difference in a second. Watch this. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. Somebody say the day. Ready? 
the day. There we go. There's a day coming. Paul is saying there's a day coming. It's not here yet, but, it, but it's in the future. There's a day coming. And how you build the house of your life, listen, it's, it's going to come to light. It's going to be revealed. We're about to read the next words. It's going to be revealed. There's a certain way, but that day is coming. He's like, I want you to be ready. Just like Jesus in Matthew 7. He's like, listen, there's a day coming. There's a storm coming. I want you to be ready for this. See, see that, that theme going on? This, this, this warning? Like, are we willing to hear that? Are we willing to, to receive that? I mean, God is trying to speak to us right now. We've been living our life a certain way, and he's like, listen, you, you can make a, a really good change right now. Okay, so, so here we go. Let's, let's keep reading now. Because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed, listen, by fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, like maybe you built with gold, silver, or costly stones, things that, you know, you put a fire to them, they, they, they come out the other side, they're okay, right? If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it's burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. In his word, God describes two very different judgments. Now, each one of us are going to be at one of these two judgments. All right, one judgment is called the great white throne judgment. Can we say great white throne together? Ready? Great white throne. Okay, so one of them is the great white throne judgment. This is the judgment of unbelievers. Everyone who is at this judgment will be condemned to hell. Why? Because they rejected Jesus. Now, some people reject Jesus like, like totally, like, like, like just really outspoken kind of way. Okay, they're just like, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Some people reject Jesus in a more subtle, passive way. All right, they're like really nice, but they're just like, I don't, I just don't, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be a good person. I don't really need Jesus, what he did on the cross. Like, oh, I don't, I'm not sure I even believe that, you know. And, and they're like really nice people, but they, but bottom line, they reject Jesus. So, so everyone at the great white throne judgment will be condemned to hell because they reject Jesus. Now, listen, there's another judgment. And this is the judgment that we see in 1 Corinthians 3. This is the judgment that we see in Matthew chapter 7. And that one's over here. It's a very different judgment. This is called the Bema judgment. Can we say Bema together? Ready? Bema. Okay, the Bema, judge, the Bema judgment is the judgment for believers. You're like, whoa, I didn't know believers were going to be judged. Listen, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. At this judgment, at the Bema judgment, believers are judged not for their sin. Whoo, another good moment right there. <laughs> we're not judged. Jesus died for our sin, so that's off the table, Okay. So there's great relief, great comfort there. But at the Bema Seat Judgment, believers are judged for how they chose to live their lives. And then each believer is rewarded according to that. Okay, so that's what's going on at the Bema Judgment, where believers are judged. Leading to this point, heaven is not going to be the same for every believer. Heaven is not going to be the same for every believer. Did you know that? For years and years and years, I never knew that. But it's true. Heaven, the experience of heaven, what it's like will not be the same for every believer. It depends on how you chose to live your life. If you live your life closely connected to Christ, like you think about him, and if you're forgetful like me, you set alarms on your phone, you get in certain habits, you, you set up appointments with people, all right, even if it's late at night, all right, one of my Bible studies is at Wednesday night at like, I get there at like 10 o'clock, Listen, I need this in my life. I'm, my mom used to call me Forgetful Jones from Sesame Street, okay, a little insider information. I need these things, right? So it's like, it's like man, are, are we living our lives con closely connected to Christ? Do we think about him? Do we talk about him? Not all the time necessarily, but do we talk about him, right? Do, do, do we make life's decisions and they have something to do with Jesus? Like Jesus is a part of that decision. If you, if you are living your life closely to, to Christ now, 
then you can expect to live your life closely connected to Christ later. But if you, as a Christian, if you live your life kind of apart from Christ now, like you don't really think about him a lot, probably don't talk about him that often, um, he certainly is not part of the equation when it comes to making decisions. And like if you're just kind of like, yeah, Christ at a distance, that's kinda, that, that would describe me right now. Listen, if we live our lives apart from Christ now, we can expect to live our lives apart from Christ later. In heaven, it's gonna be wonderful, it's gonna be awesome, but listen, if I do that, I'm not gonna have that intimacy or that closeness with Christ that I could have had. And we see that come out in the word rewards here in 1 Corinthians 3. There's a ton of stuff there, but let's emerge from that rabbit hole just for a second. With this statement, there is continuity between now and eternity. There's continuity. Like there's a connection, there's the related, there's a correlation, there's continuity between now and eternity. How I live my life now determines how I will live my life later. The fire of 1 Corinthians 3 is the same thing as a storm of Matthew chapter 7. See, Jesus is preparing us. He's given us a study guide. He's given us the answer key. He wants us as believers to be ready for that day that's not here yet, but that is coming. And when the storm comes, he wants us to be prepared. Now, building a house that lasts, let's not sugarcoat this, building a house that lasts, right? Building my house on the rock, right? Building my house with, with, with good building material. Listen, that's not easy. That can be pretty difficult, actually. And building a house that lasts, that's different. Listen, not a lot of people are doing this, right? If you choose to live your life this way, you, you are going to be noticed. And it might get a little uncomfortable sometimes too. In this life, people may persecute you. And Jesus talked about that at the beginning of the sermon. And he says you're gonna be blessed for it, right? Blessed are those, or happy are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. But in this life, yeah, People may persecute you. Many may hate you. Big bad wolves may even try to blow your house down in this life. But after this life, listen, this storm of Matthew chapter 7, it's going to strike every house in God's neighborhood. It's going to hit the houses that are built on the rock. It's going to hit the houses that are built on the sand. The floodwaters are going to rise, and they're going to sweep away everybody's Ikea furniture, okay? These, these winds, they're going, to, they're going to whip, and they're going to rip the siding off of everyone's pretty little houses, okay? But the house of your life will not fall if you choose to build it on the rock of Jesus Christ, if you make Jesus a priority, Listen, I'm not, I'm not looking back. If you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking now. God gives us that grace, right? I, I'm not gonna beat myself up over what happened or what my life has looked like, maybe for a, even a long time, but, but if right now I make Jesus a priority and I choose to follow him, right? if you do that too, the house of your life will last. God said it. It is true. Hey, do you know what one of these things are? This there it is. You ever seen one of those? That's a barometer. A barometer. Now, a barometer measures air pressure or barometric pressure, all right, or, or, or atmospheric pressure for all you chemistry nerds, okay? Like, yes, I love it. I love atmospheric pressure. Okay, yeah. So, anyways, that's a barometer. It measures atmospheric pressure, and, and it also helps to predict. For centuries, people have used this to predict storms, We have a barometer in God's word. We know with certainty that this storm of Matthew 7 is coming. But we can be ready by putting God's word into practice. Like we're hearing his words and we can put it into practice. It's that simple, right? I mean, you, you don't remember anything. Like, like a lot of emotion and, oh, I kind of liked he was energetic. And, and I think we read from Matthew 7. I don't really remember. If you fall in that category and it's hard for you to remember things, remember this. 
You can build the house of your life on the rock of Jesus Christ. How? By, by hearing his words and putting them into practice. That is Jesus' bottom line right here. Now, here's, here's some examples, some specifics. How can I do that? Let's go to back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them or is theirs. This involves, as Pastor Guy taught us weeks and weeks back, this involves realizing you really, really, really need God. Not just when you first come to him, but all along the way, like repeatedly realizing you really, really, really need God and then reaching out to him. Now, if you've never realized you really, really need God before today and you are ready to reach out to him, you're gonna have that opportunity. We're gonna do that. We're gonna take that step together if you'd like to. If God is leading, if his Holy Spirit is prompting you to do that, you're gonna have that opportunity in just a couple minutes. Here's another example. How can I be ready for the storm? How can I prepare for that day, that test that's coming? Matthew chapter six, all right? It's, it's we can be ready by not just saying the Our Father. I grew up doing that, by the way. But by living out the Lord's prayer, all right? Looking to the Lord, depending on him. God, would you give me some daily bread? I need your daily bread. When it comes to things like this, and this is very, very difficult a lot of the time, but choosing, it's a choice, choosing to forgive others even when they really, really hurt you. Choosing to forgive others like he has forgiven you. That's how you build the house of your life on the rock. That's how you get ready for that day. That's how you prepare for the storm. Here's another example. This is out of Matthew chapter 7. It's remembering Jesus and returning to him. The gospel is that good. The gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ is not just when you first come to him, but the good news is that if you drift away, like I think every one of us has, you can return to him. That's what we were talking about before. We're, not, we're gonna live our life in regret. Have we made mistakes? You bet. Have we sinned? You bet. But, but, but God gives us today that we might turn to him, that we might return to him and live our lives for him, that we might be salt and light in our family, even if our family is an absolute wreck right now, on the brink of, of just being destroyed, we can take that gift that God is giving us and we can be salt and light in our home. We can be salt and light in our community or at our workplace. Maybe people know us as one of those cutthroat Christians. Like they're like, I'm not even sure he or she is a Christian. Listen, we can make a change. And maybe we still tell the truth because the truth is important, amen? But, but maybe we can tell the truth with just a little more gentleness. Maybe that's a change that the Holy Spirit is leading you to do in your life. You can be salt and light in your home, in your community. You can follow Jesus even when it comes to believer's baptism. I know you were baptized as a baby. So was I, okay? It's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Lord, for my parents being so interested in, in nurturing me in my faith before I even knew what was going on. God, thank you. But, but in the scripture, I see this other example. When I become a Christian, right, I see over and over and over and over again that after that point, I don't care what happened in the past, after that point, I follow Jesus into the water. I can make that. God gives me that freedom. He gives me that opportunity. I can build the house of my life on the rock of Jesus Christ by hearing his words and putting them into practice. Let's not just appreciate Christ and his teachings at a distance. No, no. Let's value Jesus. Let's value what he says by hearing his words and putting them into practice by following him, choosing to build the house of our life on the rock of Jesus Christ. Let's look forward to the day not dread it, but let's look forward to the day when we stand before him, when we stand face to face with him. Let's anticipate that joy e day even with joy. All right, let's embrace his grace and let's decide because again, he gives us that freedom. I'm not pigeonholed like I can't do this, Lord, or, or, or whatever, but we can embrace his grace that he's giving and choose to live for Jesus today. Amen, can we do that? He gives us that opportunity. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you again for today. Help us to prepare for that day that is coming for each one of us. Help us to be wise and to live our lives for Jesus. May we look forward to that day when we see you, Lord, face to face even. Remembering all the while, Lord, that you are a friend of sinners. 
remembering, Lord, that you came to seek and save the lost, that you never give up, that you are constantly at work in every person's heart and in every person's life for our good and for your glory. And that even in this very moment, the constant heartbeat of your heart is this, Lord, that you don't want a single person to perish, but that even now in this moment, you welcome people into your family. God, your arms were stretched wide on the cross, but even though you're not on the cross anymore, Jesus, your arms are still stretched wide, welcoming people into your family. For anyone who realizes they really, really need Jesus, like right now, like for the first time, and, you, and you're like so interested, you can't necessarily explain it, but, but like you're interested, I wanna reach out to Jesus. Remember we said, we're gonna have that opportunity. This is now, you have that opportunity. And Jesus isn't, isn't sitting there with his arms crossed. He's not looking at you with a scowl of condemnation. Again, his arms are open wide. If you believe in Jesus and you are ready to receive him for the first time ever, let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I believe that you rose three days later for my life. I confess that I'm a sinner and that I really, really need you and what you did for me and I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you to save me and I'm trusting you to make me new from the inside out. It might be a slower process, but God, I trust you to do that good work in and through me. Thank you, Lord, amen. With heads still bowed and eyes still closed, if you receive Jesus for the first time today, would you raise your hand right now? Lord Jesus, please help every believer, every one of us, God, in Fox River. Help us as a, as a family, a community of faith to live our lives for you, choosing to follow you even when it's hard, choosing to build the house of our life on the rock of Jesus Christ and your teachings. Bless us, Lord, that we might be a blessing to others and that heaven might be all that it could be for us and them who were a blessing to and that your name, Lord, would be glorified. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.